nice to meet you in person or, or not in person. I know. You as well. Yeah. It says we're live, guys. Um, I just was tweeting. I'm just tweeting right now, so that's <laughs> off, off the window. It might just be the four of us. Let's be real. It could, it could end up just being the four of us, which wouldn't be bad. Okay, so I will explain how this works because it's not always totally clear. So nobody else would be in the video chat with us. They'll just be on the right-hand side um, sending us questions or tweeting at them. But we have, we had some users submit some questions, or some listeners submit some questions via email. And so what we've done is we've taken those questions and broken them up into sort of the categories that people were wanting to know about. Um, and so we'll just start there. Um, and... We'll see if people join us eventually. And you're the only one that can see that, right, Elaine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because all I see are just like you guys in my screen. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I can see the I can see the questions on the right hand side. So if any questions come in, then I will see them. Um, okay. Could we all could we all introduce ourselves? And Scott, I I think I want I wanted to what I told you earlier. I'd like you to say a little bit about Kacha too. Cool. Uh, okay, well, uh, I'm Scott McCauley. I edit Filmmaker Magazine. And uh, I actually um, sort of uh, was introduced by the to the work of Katja uh, uh, when we researched uh, filmmakers for our annual 25 New Faces list. And uh, both myself and Nick Dawson, who was the managing editor of Filmmaker at the time, were huge fans of High Maintenance, Katja's web series. And, you know, not just the content of the work, uh, but also the, the kind of method they were distributing, how they were distributing the work. I mean, uh, for many years at Filmmaker, we've been advocating people not just put, uh, uh, you know, all their eggs in the theatrical distribution basket. And so we were really excited to see someone do something new and, and also do a really high-quality web series. So, oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so... I'm Elaine from the podcast, and my co-host is here. I'm Sarah. And, hi, everybody. <laughs> and so <laughs> last week we last week we interviewed um, the lovely Katya, who's in LA now. Um, and you guys sent in your questions. And so one of the first ones was, um, how much of what you write is based on real experiences in high maintenance, and of that. Do those people uh, who inspired the show know that they inspired the show? Like, know that they may be characters? That is a good question. Uh, yeah, mo most of the characters and uh, scenarios that come up in High Maintenance are they're directly pulled from our lives in some fashion. A lot of, I think, most of the time, it's the, the characters and the stories come directly from Ben and my lives and and personalities, really, for better or for worse. Even even the, I think there's like a little bit of us in all the characters, the good ones, the bad ones, all of them. Um, but that being said, yeah, there are definitely some incidences and that we pull from our lives that are uh, things that maybe happen to friends <laughs> or loved ones. And we generally try to uh, give them a heads up that we're going that we were inspired by something they told us and that we want to use it or even like while they're telling us uh, recounting a story or experience to us uh, if the wheels start turning during those conversations we're pretty forthcoming about the fact that we're inspired and would like to use it and so far, all of our friends and family have been very cool about saying, "Yeah, feel free, use it. Somebody should, you know, somebody should use this," and uh, you know, have given us sort of free reign to do that. Uh, a lot of them want to be anonymous. Most of them <laughs> want to be anonymous, so we, you know, try to protect their anonymity. But some of the stuff is born out of our own imaginations. But I would say 75 to 85 percent of what we um, portray is like directly ripped from our immediate lives in some in some fashion. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite character? Do I have a favorite character? Oh man, that's so hard. Uh, I have a soft spot for the the agoraphobic huh. guy, Patrick, who was in the episode <laughs> Helen. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I have a soft spot for him. Um, I just I feel for him, but I, I don't know if I would say it's my favorite character, but that one always comes to mind when people ask me. 
Uh, I really love the assholes. They were the sort of uh, <laughs> the ones in the Olivia episode. Uh, I think Ben and I have had the easiest time writing for their voices. Um, and it, I mean, it's just it almost like writes itself when we write for them. Um, but I think I feel the closest maybe to the Candace character in Trixie. Uh, and and actually, there's a character coming out in an episode in February um, that you guys will all see in a matter of a couple of weeks that also I feel really close to, probably just because the, the characters are going through things that are like directly ripped from my life. Cool. So one of the other questions, which is a good follow-up to that, is the writing. Like, how does the writing go down? How do you and Ben split that, and what is your workflow? Uh, well, we're still sort of, well, I guess we figured it out, but I, I feel like we're, we're hard on ourselves about our process because we feel so disorganized, but then every time we talk to other writers, it sounds like their process isn't actually that dissimilar. Uh, we talk a lot before anything gets committed to paper. Uh, we, you know, we start with just talking about what kinds of characters do we want to spend time with, what actors do we want to spend time with or see again, what sort of emotion do we want to be left with when you when the episode is finished. Or sometimes it starts from a, a climax, actually, a climax moment where we're like, oh, this would, be, this would be great if this would be like the height of the episode and then we'll like work backwards from that. Um, so we talk it all through. Sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes it takes months. Sometimes we're writing about characters and situations that we developed a year ago or two years ago. And then uh, once we sort of get all of our, our ideas lined up, usually they end up being sort of um, collages of all the ideas that we've been collecting. Once we sort of funnel them into um, categories and sort of align elements and character traits with, with each other to form a story, we uh, figure out all the points in the actual story and in the episode. We, at that point, we are writing things down, uh, outlining the episode. And then uh, Ben is a little bit better at just writing in a really uncensored way and just sort of vomiting out all of the, <laughs> all of the ideas onto paper and just getting it going. He's, he's probably a little more action-oriented in that way. And um, so he'll, uh, he'll often be the one to, th at that point, take the, uh, take the outline and translate it into a first draft. And then I'll grab it and take a pass at it, you know, add, add or change dialogue or change details or add details that I think maybe are missing. Um, and then we sort of go from there. And then we start, you know, passing it back and forth. Sometimes we both feel very, uh, sometimes we both have a very clear vision of, of a story and we both feel really strongly about uh, taking the first pass. So then we'll sort of each go off in our own directions and, and take a stab at, at a first draft and then come together and sort of take the best bits and, and cobble something together that way. It, it changes all the time, but, uh, but that's sort of generally how it goes down. I have a quick follow-up question, and it's more technical, but what tools do you guys use? And like, do you have, like, uh, is it all on paper? Like, do you have, like, a Bible of all your ideas, or do you use Google Docs, or, you know, how do you guys you Yeah. Know? We well at home in New York we have a big bulletin board that we keep on our on our wall and anytime we have a, a thought be it you know a joke that we want to be sure to f to feature somewhere or an actor that we that catches our eye or that we remember that we want to work with you know whatever it may be um, a story point a plot point um, we'll write it down on these little note cards and they sort of get stuck up on this board and then over time that that's what we're sort of using to physically group the ideas together so that we can sort of visually get a sense of what episodes are shaping up to look like. And then things sort of go t to a Google Doc, actually. Um, that's where we sort of craft our outlines and, and do sort of like a data dump. And then we use Final Draft, like I think most people do. <laughs> um, but, but really, it, it takes a while before we get to that point. Up until that point, we're sort of, you know, Things are kind of floating around in piecemeal in various places. Mm -hmm. cool. Well, we have we have lots of viewers right now. Oh. So people Hi. are joining, so thanks for joining. Cool. Uh, on the right hand side, you should be able to see a question between anything. So if you're watching and you have questions, 
um, please submit them soon. And we have 20 minutes left. So, um, so Scott, do you have anything before we jump to another listener question? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, Katja, on the um, on the the podcast um, that's currently up. Towards the end, you had there's a great little section where you talk about fighting with Ben and about your people in your neighboring apartment hearing you fight. And I think you say like you, what's you know what's not so great is they don't hear you make up. Like they can hear the fight, but not the makeup. And I uh, I'm also a producer. I work with my partner. We've had our share of fights. So I'm curious, like, what do you guys? You didn't say what you normally fight about, and I'm curious where the elements of conflict are in your professional relationship. Oh man, do we we only have 20 minutes, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, they're varied. I mean, sometimes, and I think we've talked about this in other interviews, uh, because we are so intimate with each other, and because we we really do spend so much time together, Ben and I more than I think most couples do and more than I think most work colleagues do and friends. I mean, we are truly, we're together every day, sometimes all day, sometimes for days and weeks on end. Like we were just saying, we don't remember the last time we uh, had like even a day away from each other because it's just the sort of the nature of how our schedule has shaken down in recent months. Um, but that's not abnormal for us. We're always together. So that being said, we have very uh, intimate knowledge of each other's like every little nuanced expression and you know if there's a, a change in tone or inflection like those can get interpreted um, huh. you know in ways that sometimes cause fights and uh, I think you know we're both very emotional people and I'll speak for myself I, I have a problem with taking things very personally and have a lot of insecurities so uh, it's easy for me to feel like personally attacked even though no attack is being made, you know, things like that. Uh, that's sort of the source of a lot of the the arguments that come up. They're like, you guys, it's boring ego related stuff. I think it's the stuff of, of a lot of fights that happen between creative partners. I, I think most of the time we're pretty much on the same page about um, the core stuff, the stuff that matters. I think it's sometimes just like maybe the little details that we get um, hung up on, I guess. And, yeah, there's more things I could say, but they might, they're, I'm almost like no, a little good. too that's embarrassed a, to, to divulge any more about what the fights are about, but, but I think you can probably get the picture. The baby, pool, the baby pool comparison that Ben told you, Elaine, at Tacoma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Ben told me that being married was like being in a baby pool with another fish. You could feel like every move ripple they made. <laughs> that was right when I was about to get married. But that's very poetic and we very our, We just got our first question. I'm so excited. Oh, cool. So, well, our first question on the live chat. So what's yeah, the original yeah. budget for the web series? And how did you convince, obviously, great actors and collaborators to work with you for what I assume was a low-budget project? What was the first part of the question? I missed that. What was the original budget for the web series? Oh, the original budget. The original budget was really no budget. Uh, we didn't, we were very um, loose in the way that we went about putting that first episode together. We were lucky enough that um, we actually have great actors in our very own family. The first episode we did is called Stevie. And if you've seen that one, it is the one where there's sort of like a, a harried assistant who um, has a terrible boss who's just like harassing her over a, a Blackberry for most of the episode. Uh, so that woman is our sister-in-law, Bridget Maloney. She uh, is somebody who I actually met 10 years ago, met her before I even met Ben, sort of indirectly met Ben through her. But anyway, that's how we got access to, that's where we started. We, we, we set the bar pretty high and we were lucky enough that that actor was in our very own family. So um, we, yeah, we didn't really know how much it would cost to put something like this together. We actually didn't give it a lot of thought. We knew we could probably afford to, to spend a few hundred dollars. We knew that Bridget, who normally is in LA, was going to be in New York, so we took advantage of that. We didn't have to like pay for her travel or housing or anything like that because she was already there for a wedding. Um, we paid for the hotel room. We bought everybody Thai food for lunch, and we rented some sound equipment from the woman who, who ran sound. We paid a kit rental, which was probably like 
I don't know, I don't remember, it's been a while, but like a couple hundred dollars. So all told, that first episode was somewhere between, I think it was somewhere around $500. And uh, they kind of hovered in that price range, actually, for the first many episodes. And yeah, as you guessed, that is a result of a lot of favors and, and people just being cool enough to, you know, donate their resources for free, be it a space or, or their equipment or their talent. And how do we get access to such great actors? I mean, like I said, we, it was great that we started from that place that we did. It was easier. It's always easier to entice other great actors to come aboard when they've seen the company that they are going to be in, and those people are also great actors. But I mean, I've, I had been working in casting for almost a decade at the point when we started, so I already had a lot of personal relationships with actors that I felt comfortable enough to just sort of reach out to. Plus, Russell Gregory, our third EP, and uh, on the show and manager has an amazing roster and actually those first 13 episodes I feel like he's got a client at the center of almost every one of those <laughs> um, and we wrote those episodes for those people so that's how we had the access. Awesome. Yeah. All right so I think that leads into another question which was um, sort of like a nitty-gritty question about the cameras you use and what, uh, how long you know, it takes to film one of these episodes, and someone asked about permits in New York, like if you're getting these things, are you running and gunning it? Like, oh, and the, I guess another thing about being on set is, is it real weed? Huh. Okay, cool. Well, I'll start with, is it real weed? No, it is not real weed. Um, people, we have two, two sorts of things going on. There's the prop weed that uh, Ben's character carries around with him uh, and it's what you see sort of when he's you know having a transaction with a customer and that is made by our production assistants and interns and whoever's whoever's available to make stuff it's uh, and it's really uh, made of just cotton balls and glue and a bunch of herbs and uh, like parsley and marjoram and <laughs> stuff like that uh, and then the weed that people the weed that people smoke on the show is um, actually a blend of herbs that uh, come from our local apothecary <coughs> and they're, sm they're smoking herbs and they're sort of like it, it, it's almost amounts to like the stuff that's in those theater cigarettes that you know the herbal cigarettes that people use for stage productions which we've also used we've sometimes just like opened up the cigarette the the stage cigarettes and like Put them into put the the filler into a smoking device. Uh, so not no weed is actually smoked on the set. And if an actor like has a an issue with even smoking the fake stuff, we find that out ahead of time and we write around that and, and don't require we don't require anybody to do that. So there's that. Um, in terms of permits and things like that, you know, in the beginning we were very fast and loose and just kind of did what we wanted to do and and sort of. We're more of a ask for forgiveness later. Don't ask for per don't ask for permission. Sort of a there was that vibe going on on set. Um, so we did a lot of that, but we but we also did you know wherever we could uh, get permits, we did. Especially when it was just you know like shooting out on the New York City streets, those permits are not hard to obtain. Uh, or for like shooting on the High Line, things like that. Th those people are pretty cool about shooting as long as you're forthcoming about what you're doing. Plus, we always had a crew of, in the beginning of like five people. So it wasn't like we were stopping traffic or, or blocking parking spots or anything like that. So people were pretty cool about granting us permission. And now, I mean, we do everything by the book. Since we, you know, teamed up with Vimeo and, and we like, we're totally legit with like a pr production insurance and, and like a real producer and all that sort of a thing. Um, who's making sure that everything is pro properly in order. And we've also been doing this on the SAG New Media contract when it comes to, you know, for the actors, that is the agreement that we're working under and that's how we're able to work with union actors but not pay them very much or not pay them anything at all as, we, as it used to be in the beginning. Um, in terms of the cameras, that is a whole, I could, I actually can make a list and make that available to the public. It would be quicker than me trying to go through the 19 episodes and recount, like, which camera we use, because actually there's, like, probably five plus different cameras that we've used over the years, so, you know, I'd rather just, like, write it out and, and give, give y'all access to it that way. 
Cool, yes, yeah, since we have two minutes left. And we have yeah. three new questions. Yeah, um, also, Elaine, real quick, too, there's one that came in from Twitter that I don't want to forget about either. So maybe after these three. Yeah, I'll do one of these, and then do you want to do the one on Twitter? Right, yeah. Okay, so this one's from Allison Otto. What do you think will be the future of web series content, and what have been some of the best benefits and doubt and downsides of creating a web series? And if you uh, I know yeah. since we only have ten minutes, you can you can speak briefly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm not very good at being. No, it's okay. uh, <laughs> you, you might are. have noticed. Um, future of web series. I think there's no stopping them. I think this is. I think we can all agree that that's that's where everything is moving. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it won't necessarily look like how it is now with with all these sort of little. Uh, well, I think there will always be an independent market, but I think what's going to happen is like Amazon and Netflix and Vimeo and these sorts of entities, I think they're going to sort of, it's going to shake down where they're going to feel like the studios to um, the more indie world of film production, like what most people are doing. I think there's going to be like the big budget ones that are financed by those entities and then there will be like everything else. And the, the good ones will emerge from, from the indie pool, I think, as things do. I think the cream usually rises to the top, and we all, we all tend to learn about those things that are worth watching. Some things just take a little bit longer to get on everyone's radar. But I think that's where everything's moving. I think everything is, is, is moving to the, to the digital world. So the future looks great. Uh, and, uh, and what was the other question? <laughs> uh, I think that's good. Yeah, because okay. there's another, uh, Sarah, before you move to the Twitter, there was a follow-up, but not, it's from a different person, but I think it goes nicely with to wrap up this uh, point, which is, what is the best advice to give others to making web series with so many out there these days? What do you think are some of the best things a web series can do to get noticed beyond making the best work that you can, which is obviously oh, important? And that's from uh, Katie Tabaldi. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. It's all right. It's so hard to answer because... Um, I feel like sometimes it's so subjective what what makes us enjoy a piece of work. I think we can all agree that uh, you know just something being technically good, like the the technical aspects of the filmmaking all sort of being in place, that's sort of um, crucial, I think, to getting people to take your work seriously if you're putting a web series out there. Um, I th uh, and now I'm like already losing track of the point of the question because I'm nervous about running out of time. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, all the questions. Sorry, guys. If don't. No, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. Uh, oh, advice. Yeah, for getting your stuff seen. I think. I think you have. I think filmmakers have to um, not get caught up in what they think the market out there wants or what or what they think there's a market for. I think it's it's a mistake to sort of. Um, to, to come at it from that angle. I think a lot of people sort of see the, the web series format as this opportunity to, to create a calling card for themselves and get them, their work out there when they're not represented, you know, or, um, you know, when they're just trying to make a way for themselves. It's just there's such a low barrier to entry that it's just, it just feels accessible and people just gravitate towards it. But, but the, the ease of, of getting your work out there in this way, I think, does sometimes create this, like, impatience in, in people where they're not necessarily um, putting in the time to create a product that can sort of compete with, with the other media that's out there. Um, sort of the higher end media that is actually getting the like critical attention and or the eyeballs. Sometimes things aren't even getting critical attention, but they just have like a ton of viewers. So, you know, I think the immediacy of being able to put your work up um, online sometimes that that uh, is a detriment to the work just because it doesn't have enough time to get fully baked. Ha ha ha! I just totally used a a pot joke, um, <laughs> or I just totally made a pot pun. But the, the work um, the work doesn't get the work sometimes is sort of half baked when it when it goes online because people just are like well I can just get it out there quickly and and maybe they're thinking like oh pilot season is coming if they're an actor and they've created something that's a vehicle for themselves or you know they want to enter a festival or what you know people are sort of operating around these these very specific goals and objectives that are sometimes tied into you know industry timeline and. And yeah, I think that's sort of one of the things that people should be wary of. Put put stuff out there when it's ready. Put something out there if if it's only if it's really good. The world will wait. And um, and don't you know you can't 
you can't please everyone. You can you can try to make something that you think is going to resonate with a lot of people, but does it resonate with you? Is this you know is this something you would want to watch? I think that's where one has to start, and I think it's very easy for a lot of people to just sort of treat it as like a vehicle for themselves to get noticed versus making like a quality product that a lot of people will will enjoy, but ultimately is something that they would want to watch. And I think that's that's sort of the criteria that that we try to start from. You know, is this is this watchable for us? <laughs> is this something that we would actually enjoy? And a lot of the time, the stuff that we would enjoy, we're sitting there thinking like, oh my God, no one is going to like this. This is the moment where everyone turns on us. This is so specific to us, this joke or this moment. Like, people are going to, this is going to go over their heads or they're not going to get it or they're going to think it's stupid. You can't get caught up in those things. Um, it's really served us well to just sort of look at, you know, do we like this? Would we watch this? Is it good enough to to put out there and and be amongst these other things that we respect and admire and if the answer is yes we put it out there so I don't know if that work is well, that will work for everybody but that was sort of our recipe and it's served as well cool Sarah do you wanna I think that this person um, is George Hudson and I think you just answered his question that's good yeah all right <laughs> I hope that was good for you uh, Scott do you wanna jump in and another question before we go to another yeah re really quickly uh, Katya what have you guys learned from doing a second season with Vimeo where the model has changed oh, sorry about this uh, the model has changed to a, a pay model um, how's that affected your audience and what have you learned well we've learned that people when something has been free for a long time people do not enjoy paying for it uh, you know we've had a little bit of pushback for that our loyal fans have of course come through and and supported us with their dollars but I think one thing I've learned is that if something is called a web series, a lot of most people expect it to be free. That is the expectation, and so that's that's been that's been interesting for us because you know we want to make a living as filmmakers, and it's you know as we all know it's really hard to do at the independent level. So um, that's been food for thought. You know I think we're going to continue to do it this way, but we're going to have to seek more ways of sort of getting the word out and, and convincing people of the fact that you know it's worth their time to to put in their credit card information I think a lot of people say oh I just wish it was on Netflix and to and to that I'm always like but you pay for Netflix <laughs> too did you forget that your card gets debited every month for that um, but there's like a psychology behind it that we hadn't quite um, thought that much about I think when we started we were just very excited to get funding to be able to do this and not have to do it out of our own pocket and to be able to pay our cast and crew so um, that's that's been interesting and the other thing too is you know prior to the Vimeo deal we were this was very much on our own timetable and we were we were putting the episodes out when when it suited us, when they were ready, when we had an idea and it struck us and, and that's when we would shoot it and when it when we felt like editing it, that's when we would edit it and when we felt like releasing it, so on and so forth. Now we're we're on a, a bit of a timetable. We had an agreement to release episodes before the end of last year and and we need to release these, you know, by a certain time and that changes things. It becomes more like a traditional T V model where you're you're writing on a schedule and you're releasing on a schedule and that does cramp a little bit of the, it puts a little bit of a, a, a crimp in the spontaneity factor, um, which we haven't liked as much, to be honest. I don't, I don't, this was so much more enjoyable for so many reasons doing it this way, chiefly being able to pay people, but in other ways it was not as enjoyable because it was more of a job. It wasn't such a, it, it ceased to be a purely uh, passion project, if that makes, it ceased to be a pure passion project, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we probably need to wrap up, but I, there's tons of questions. But I, I want to just ask you, like, after watching, um, after watching uh, or listening to you, the podcast, was there anything that you want to like? You didn't feel like you said in there that you like wanted to say to? I don't know, because it's edited. So, like, was yeah. there anything when you listen to it? You're like, oh, I wish, I wish they, people would know this or something. Mm, no, I think you ladies did such a great job of uh, of taking them. The I don't. Even, I couldn't even tell you like, oh, I said that and they didn't include it. I, I that that doesn't even that didn't even cross my mind. Um, I think one thing that I will say though, you know, Ben and I get interviewed a lot together, 
and uh, people really view us as a team, and we are completely like this. This project is 100% a uh, collaboration, and you know, if you removed one of either one of us from that equation, it would cease to be what it is. Pe people probably wouldn't watch it. Um, so, in and and through all the the interest and press that has that we've been lucky enough to be afforded because of this project. Um, you know, Ben is often the point of interest for most people because he's he's the face of it, and he's sort of the more gregarious, uh, you know, entertaining, charming <laughs> person to, to listen to. That's why he's that's why he's on camera. That's why I wanted to put him on camera. Um, and I've never had those ambitions really to be that person that's the face of something or putting myself on camera. But now that we're suddenly thrust into this. A situation where a, a project that we've done together is getting all this attention, it does become weird sometimes to, um, to to be in that situation where one person gets like a little bit more or a lot more recognition for something that I've put in, you know, as much time into. It's, it's a really weird space. And then I have this like weird ego struggle with like, hey, I do it too. You know, like when we're like out on the street and someone just and this happens pretty much daily. People come up to Ben when we're together and just say, I love the show, man. Keep doing it. I love it. And, like, there's a part of my heart that, like, soars because I'm like, yeah, it's happening. People know about it. They're appreciating it. And I was part of it. And then there's, like, this shitty part of me that's also, like, wanting to be like, oh, excuse me, but I do it too. Like, I'm one of the creators and, like, I, I came up with it too. Uh, and then I always, you know, go through this cycle of, like, you know, that, and then it goes to, like, Shut up, Katya. Who cares? They like the show. Just take the, just be glad. Yay, you know. And then, you know, it's like a whole cycle of of ego shit that I deal with regularly. So I guess uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, except that that's like a weird struggle that that doesn't come up much, um, or I don't like have much opportunity to ever name that, or I don't know why I would. I don't want to dwell on it. But I'm in the in the interest of being honest with people. Like that is a real thing that we you know that comes up a lot in our in our lives as a creative duo. And um, I think it's cool to I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to um, to speak with you ladies as myself because I'm you know I'm an individual and and you know while I am a wife and a and a creative partner to this other person you know I'm also I also have my own sort of set of of ideas and opinions, and it was nice. I, I like really appreciated that you guys took the time to talk to me and and single out women who are doing things that I'm doing because, unfortunately, there's not as big of a, a platform I think for for women filmmakers and and creatives to to talk about this stuff. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh -huh. Well, if we could, we would put your face on a billboard. And <laughs> I would not be comfortable with that, <laughs> but, um, but I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Scott and Katja, for joining Sarah and I on this. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. Have and I can, if you want me to answer those other questions over Twitter or on blog yeah. or elsewhere, I'm happy to. Yeah, huh. do you want to tell people your Twitter handle? Yes, it is... Uh, K Blickfeld, so K B as in boy, L I C H F E L D, and that's me. Yeah, and if you, a yeah, go questions ahead. Right hand side from Rory and uh, Kartik, I think his name is. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. So if you guys want to tweet those, that would be great. Cool. Cool. Thank you guys cool. so much. And uh, just an update on the show. Next Wednesday we have uh, an interview with Lyric Cabral, who Woo! is. Hearing, uh, yeah. Her documentary Terror at Sundance. Can't uh, wait. Yeah. And it's getting a lot of buzz and it's very, very exciting. So she was part of your twenty five faces. Yeah. Fans. Another one. Yeah. yeah. So she's awesome. She's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. So tune in for that on Wednesday on iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud. And we will be putting this video um, on our website afterwards so that you can share it with other people that weren't able to shoot in. So thank you guys. Cool. Oh, and high maintenance. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Thing. I'm terrible at plugging. <laughs> I'm just counting down the day. I'm super excited. <laughs> oh, what would I be without you guys? Uh, we premiere new episodes on February 5th on Vimeo on Demand. You can go to highmaintenance.tv to purchase the cycle, this 
latest these latest two cycles of six episodes, it's seven ninety nine for all six. And um, and yeah, and I hope you enjoy them. Yeah, and we'll remind, we'll remind you many times. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> bye guys. Thank you so much. Okay, bye Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. bye.